Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is lesson number 12 in a series entitled, The Least of These, Ministering to Those in Need. And this lesson is entitled, To Love Mercy. It's the lesson for September 21 of 2019. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming and studying your word together, thinking about the challenges that are there for us and how we can reach out and be shining lights to those around us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. So the question for today is, how do we reach out to the poor and needy in our world today? We've talked about ways in which God set up the Hebrew economy. He wanted them to reach out to the people around them and take care of the poor and needy among them. Even returning property to uh, the original owners after a certain period of time. But those times were long ago and nothing like that is happening in our world today that I know of. Has God intentionally allowed some people to be poor, oppressed, disabled, or needy to test the rest of us? No, I think it just happens. It just happens, huh? Just because of the world the way it is. I can tell you that uh, I had the privilege of welcoming, welcoming into my home someone who told me quite a story. I won't go into all the details, but he was involved in restoring Germany after the Second World War, and he was representing the United States. And he called a bunch of people together and said, what are we going to do about the currency? Nobody knows the old currency is worthless. What are we going to do? And so forth. Anyway, to make a long story short, they decided in his living room that they would start all over fresh and they would just arbitrarily give anyone who could prove they were a German 40 Deutschmarks. The Deutschmark was invented in his, his, his living room. And he said it wasn't long before some people had a lot and other people had none. So, is the devil behind that? The devil has made it? sure that our world is riddled with poverty, violence, oppression, slavery, exploitation, selfishness, which is, of course, his trademark, and greed. Yeah, I think he is. Or is it our own doing? Or both? Are we following the devil's example? God calls us as Christians and as Christian groups to live in that environment showing compassion, creativity, and courage. Can we really act, as it says in Micah 6, 8, justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God? What would that mean in 2019? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with our God. What do you think? Can we do that? command is the same then as now. We... We just have to apply it to uh, deal with people in just ways, merciful ways, mm -hmm. and, and all of that flows from our walk with God. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's really what it is. Yeah. Well, how do Christian churches become compassionate, creative, and courageous in reaching out to those in need? If, 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 have any of you been in a church where there were some really creative ways to reach out to people in need? I can tell you that I was in a small church one time in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, I won't go into all the details, but we got started offering, and those were the days when people were just starting to realize how, how bad cigarettes were. And we offered stop smoking plans and it was done very well by a couple of the church members and also uh, healthful cooking and exercise programs and we had people waiting in line to get into our classes. Hmm. It was amazing. I don't know where that would take us today. Well, the Christians in our world who are truly following Jesus are marching to a different drummer. They have different values and different priorities than does the world. And you remember these famous words from Matthew 6, starting with verse 25. This is why, and this is Jesus, part of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus said, this is why I tell you not to be worried about the food and drink you need in order to stay alive or about clothes for your body. 
After all, isn't life worth more than food? Or, and isn't the body worth more than clothes? Look at the birds. They do not sow seeds, gather harvest, and put in barns. Yet your Father in heaven takes care of them. Aren't you worth much more than birds? Can any of you live a bit longer by worrying about it? Maybe live a little bit shorter by worrying about it. And why worry about clothes? Look how the wild flowers grow. They do not know or make clothes for them, do not work or make clothes for themselves. But I tell you that not even King Solomon with all his wealth had clothes as beautiful as one of these flowers. It is God who clothes the wild grass, grass that is here today and gone tomorrow, burnt up in the oven. Won't he be all the more sure to clothe you how little faith you have? So do not start worrying. Where will my food come from or my drink or my clothes? So there's God's instructions. God has provided enough to sustain life and health here on planet Earth. If everyone lived on, living on planet Earth were looking out for others, there would be no problem at all. But how are Christians who are a relative minority of this Earth's population supposed to reach out in these ways? Was it easier to follow the suggestions of Jesus in his day than it is today? What do you think? Well, we're aware of of uh, more of the world mm -hmm. uh, today. You know, back then it was, you know, pretty much what was up close and personal, although in Paul's day... Uh, they were aware of the famine in Israel and they sent uh, uh, offerings to help out. Mm -hmm. So there was some mm -hmm. uh, some awareness, but there was a vast amount of the world that they had no idea what yeah. was going on. Now we're just bombarded yeah. every time something breaks out. And we don't have enough logistics to handle the whole world. The world's growing enough, we're just not getting it shared around. Yeah. Well, if you happen to be living in one of the more developed countries of the world, there are government programs designed to deal with many of these problems. So we don't have to worry about it, right? Because the government always does everything better. I didn't say that, did it you? It likes to think they do. <laughs> well, some government programs are very well-intentioned, but others are certainly not. And even the ones who are well-intentioned often find out to turn out to be very wasteful. I remember a radio commentator who did a lot of analyzing the government many years ago and said, in general, the government will, will, will cost three times as much to do a job as private, mm -hmm. as, as private organizations. Somebody who has been involved in that sort of thing had suggested that people send money so that they can buy the things locally rather than sending shoes and clothes and then they have to sort through those things and they may not be all that good it, it just creates a lot of waste uh, sometimes yeah. unless somebody is asking for specific things it's better to send money so that they can buy locally and, and uh, dispense it locally Paul in Romans 13 talks quite a bit about doing what the government says, paying your taxes. It's part of what a Christian should do. Is that still valid information? Remember that government, that very government ended up beheading him. How would you feel if you knew that in advance? There to keep the peace. That was the Pax Ramona. Uh, from yeah, Pax Romana. Romana. Yeah, the Pax Romana. Mm -hmm. So that allowed safer travel on the whole. Yeah. And uh, various things. But uh, then there are those who misuse their authority. And yeah. Peter and the other apostles replied. Here's the time when Peter and John particularly, perhaps others as well, we must obey God, not God. Man, how does that apply to us today? You remember that Jesus said, Render to Caesar what Caesar's and unto God what is God's, Matthew twenty two twenty one. Is that what we should be doing? Hope we have the wisdom to know which is which. Which should be rendered to Caesar and yeah. which should be rendered to God. 
But we Seventh-day Adventists know a day is coming when governments around the world will pass laws that are directly contrary to the law of God. How are we going to deal with that? Are we prepared to stand up for what we believe is true even at the potential risk of our lives? Well, if you uh, have had the privilege of reading, for example, some of the stories of the Walden Seas and others back in history, the martyrs down through the generations, especially the treatment of Jesus, how they treated Jesus, is clear indication that faithful living will not always prevent evil. Jackie, I think you have some words about that. This is uh, from Testimonies for the Church. When the laws of men conflict with the word and law of God, we are to obey the latter, whatever the consequences may be. The law of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey, and we must abide the consequences of violating this law. The slave is not the property of any man. God is his rightful master, and man has no right to take God's workmanship into his hands and claim him as his own. Do you know when that was written? Well, there, the date's right there. 18. Not on mine. What is it? No. Is it in your, is it in your handout? Yeah, 1859. Not on mine. Yep. I, I said year. before the... Not on mine. It's this is the year old. before the Civil War started. Yeah. 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 I don't no. know. That's, I don't know how, how that could have gotten out of yours. Good. Well, sorry. Yeah. You could also put in there Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. Yeah. Can you tell me who is not a slave to some or greater or lesser degree? Yeah. So where is the line between the obedience to authorities and standing up for those who might be victims of an oppressive authority? Will there be times when we have to stand up for others against the National Sunday Law? Would that put us at risk also? Very likely, huh? Yeah. I mean, imagine what would happen if you if we were, you know, in charge of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and all of a sudden we get the rule that, uh, you know, Sunday is Sabbath keeping is against the law. What's going to happen to the church at that point in time? Are they going <coughs> to fade into oblivion? Or these are challenging questions. Some Christians are experiencing what they call compassion fatigue. What does that mean? Anybody have an idea? Too much to be. There are so much, so much need that you don't know. I mean, you don't know where to begin. Almost exactly. Yeah, and so many people crying for help here and there. You you finally just say, you know, hold, throw up your arms. So how do we decide? between the request from so many different directions for financial support, for example. <laughs> Unfortunately, some of the most, some let me just put it this way, some very common organizations that are well known, asking for funds, they call pretty regularly. If you look up online and you go to someone who's checking out these organizations, you find out that like 90% of the money they raise is spent on money raising, the organization, so for only 10% goes to what they're actually uh, claiming the money is for. Yeah. That's crazy. But we went to, uh, we were in um, Colorado with our daughter, and we went with the Arvada Church down to Denver to the Salvation Army, and we provided some what we had. We provided what we had and gave them a meal. But they have, this was a man's, and they had these bunk bed, not bunk beds, but these beds, and they had them with headboards and sideboards, you know, with a mattress, blankets, and they provide them a roof over their head and a place to stay. Yeah. An old warehouse <coughs> yeah. that they oh, good. had. So, uh, you know, if you have nothing, yeah. Having a place to stay that is pretty much safe, mm -hmm. uh, it was. I I just was very impressed with it. Yeah, and the people that were working there, there were only a couple that were working there, but uh, 
they were very nice to the inmates or what? Clients. You know, clients. Resident. Client. Clients. Yeah. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, Dennis, I think you've got a few words about that as well. All right. This is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday, September 16. Because many situations of injustice and poverty are complicated, listening and learning what what we can about <coughs> the situations is important. There have been many examples in which well-intentioned people have caused damage to other people's lives by trying to help. While this is not an excuse for inaction, we should seek to get involved in ways that are informed and thoughtful. Very good, Ed. And dealing with all these problems around us, it is not always necessary to think first of financial solutions or even practical actions. Often the first thing that needs to happen is prayer. I remember many years ago, um, a well-known Adventist pastor visited Egypt. Back in the days when it wasn't so easy to visit Egypt. And the Adventist church in Egypt in those days was really struggling. And so the pastor, after spending some time with one of the pastors there uh, was getting ready to leave and he said what what can we do for you and the pastor said we need more prayer amen we need more prayer that was his request and then the second thing was that's all he said only prayer mm -hmm. God can touch those two fishes and those five loaves yep Unfortunately, sometimes when we reach out to help groups, the money is misused at the other end. And that can be a real disappointment to those who understand or discover what's happening. If people use the money in different ways than what we thought they were going to use it for, should we disrespect their choices? We should probably give them feedback and uh, give them a chance to correct their ways if, mm -hmm. if our logic is correct. Some people in those situations call that kind of stuff toxic charity. Pretty sad, if it, particularly if it ends up in some church workers, a significant amount of the money ends up in somebody's pocket instead of where it was intended to go. So whenever possible, we need to make merciful intervention a community-driven project rather than a volunteer-driven project through the use of external funds and personnel. We should ask several important questions. Margaret? All right. In what ways is the questions we should ask, in what ways is capable indigenous, i.e. local and native leadership behind the effort? Uh, how does the program show that it has the ultimate self-sufficiency of the neighborhood as a primary objective? Number three, what ways does the plan emanate from the local church, which partners with the entities in the community? Four, how does the plan promote interdependency rather than continued dependency? And this Very is from good. the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Mm -hmm. Well. That's a challenge. How do you get out there and someone needs to be out there and really sort of analyze the situation and figure out how, how can you work with the local people if you want that to be... And it's not, it's not something... Oh, send some money. And it's not that simple. We can't... On the other hand, we can't just ignore people's needs. Uh, Jim? In the early church, James, from chapter 2, 15 and 16, has a quote here. It's pretty practical advice. Suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm, eat well, if, <laughs> if you don't give them the necessities of life? So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no action, then it is dead. Wow. Well, look at Second Corinthians 9, 7. You should each give then as you have decided, not with regret or out of a sense of duty, for God loves the one who gives gladly. Okay? Generosity is an important aspect of the Christian life, but generosity includes more than financial assistance. Gordon? 
Leviticus 25, 35 to 37, if a fellow Israelite living near you becomes poor and cannot support himself or herself, you must provide for them as you would for hired servants so that they may continue to live near you. Do not charge them any interest, but obey God and let your fellow Israelites live near you. Do not make them pay interest on the money you lend them, and do not make a profit on the food you sell them. Wow. That's pretty blunt advice, isn't it? Don't take advantage of the poor. Yeah. And it goes on. There's a lot of other passages that say things similar. Psalm 119, 36... 2 Corinthians 8, 12 to 15, 1 John 3, 16 to 18, 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Clearly, Paul felt that those who had adequate amounts of money should reach out to help others who were in need. Generosity should be an attitude that permeates the life of Christians. We need to die to self and live more for others, remembering that selfishness is the essence of the satanic kingdom while love is the essence of God's kingdom. And some might think that their meager funds prevent them from giving anything. Such people should review Mark 12, 41 to 44. Myra, I think you can help us with that. As Jesus sat near the temple treasury, he watched the people as they dropped in their money. Many rich men dropped in a lot of money. Then a poor widow came along and dropped in two little copper coins worth about a penny. He called his disciples together and said to them, I tell you, that this poor widow put in more in the offering box than all the others, for the others put in put in what they had to spare of their riches, but she, poor as she is, put in all she had and gave all she had to live on. I think about that story and I stop and ask myself, okay, who was in charge of the temple at that point in time? <coughs> Sadducees. The Sadducees. And can you imagine at the end of the day they're collecting all the money out of these boxes and when they came to those two little copper coins they probably said there's so many silver coins and maybe some gold coins and what are they going to do with these funny little copper things? But why would Jesus say she gave more than all the others? Because she gave all she had. Yeah. Okay. So there are people today in our church who say well I don't like the way the church is using It's money. So I'm going to stop giving. Is that a valid thing to do? In light of this story? What what was happening to... I mean, God knew... Jesus knew perfectly well, I'm sure, what was going to happen to those two little coins. And yet he, he made this point. There are ways to be generous without just giving money. The most precious gift of all is time. When we are willing to seek people out and try to help them, it is almost beyond belief. Often it will lead people to tears of joy. I spent part of this afternoon taking a couple of uh, medical residents to some private homes to make home visits to see how the people are doing, what we could do. And, you know, it's amazing how people respond when you do something like that. You know, the doctor came to my house to see what he could do to help me. I mean, they just... It used to be how it was at one yeah. time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, pe- Christians should also be peacemakers. You remember Matthew <coughs> 5, 9 and Mark thirteen seven. Violent conflicts are everywhere in our day. It seems like even the least bit of difference of opinion can lead to some kind of conflict. People are shot in the streets... I another patient I had today, young guy, healthy young guy at one point in time, someone shot him with a bullet that just splattered when it hit him and just, I mean, paralyzed from almost the neck down. Mm. So sad. But the biggest conflict end up and and you know, he was riding in the back of somebody else's truck, and they could not even see him. So whoever shot him had no idea. I mean, this is completely random. There's no way that... I mean, they might have been had something against the guy driving the truck, but they couldn't have had anything against the guy who was riding in the back. Mm. But the biggest conflicts, of course, end up in wars. 
And those wars have terrible consequences, not only for those who died, but also for those who are survivors and veterans. And we talk today about PTSD. It would be perfect if everyone would act in Christian ways and no wars would ever start. But what, what are we supposed to do with the Adolf Hitlers and the Napoleons of the world? Should we um, figure out who, who they are and just arrest them and put them in prison? On what basis would you do that? Evil motives. It catches up with them sooner or later. One of the worst, worst, worst drug kingpins, we call them here in this country, uh, just was condemned to life in prison plus 30 years today. El Chapo? Mm-hmm. Yes. How many? There's no justice in America. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that means that he can't he can't get his friends to help him out of jail like he did before. Have you looked at his eyes? Oh, he looks like he's spaced. Yeah. He's well, I mean, think think on how many tons of heroin and yeah. cocaine no, and so how forth. Many deaths he's caused. He's, oh yeah. Probably getting it in jail. Well, okay, Jim. Second uh, Corinthians five tells us something. Verses eighteen to twenty one. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making the whole human race his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us the message which tells how we are, excuse me, how he makes them his friends. Here we are, then speaking for Christ, as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, let God change... (laughs) Excuse me. Let God change you from enemies into his friends. Christ was without sin, but for God... Excuse me. But for our sake, God made him share (coughs) our sin in order that in union with him we might share the righteousness of God. Wow. Amen. Amen is right. Carrie? The heart that is in harmony with God is a partaker of the peace of heaven and will diffuse its blessed influence on all around. The spirit of peace will rest like dew upon hearts weary and troubled with worldly strife. Wow. That's a pretty nice wordsmithing there. Yeah. Yes. Thoughts from the mind. The spirit of peace will rest like dew. Yeah. upon hearts weary and troubled. Isn't that beautiful? It is. Amen. It is. I, 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 I've, of course, read a lot. I've read almost every book that Ellen White has available and listened to many of them. And I almost, let me read two or three sentences of something and I can almost tell you that's from Ellen White because of the wonderful, just her kind of way she wrote it and so forth. It's just... Well, conflicts have been so common in the history of our world that they were one of the first things that Jesus dealt with in his Sermon on the Mount. Look at Matthew 5, 21 through 26. You have heard that people were told in the past, do not commit murder. Anyone who does will be brought to trial. But now I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother will be brought to trial. Whoever calls his brother you good for nothing will be brought before the council and whoever calls his brother a worthless fool will be in danger of going to the fire of hell. So if you're about to offer your gift to God at the altar, uh, gift to God at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, go at once and make peace with your brother, and then come back and offer your gift to God. If someone brings a lawsuit against you and takes you to court, settle the dispute with them while there is time, before you go to court. Once you are there, he will hand you over to the judge, he will hand you over to the police, and you will be put in jail. There you will stay, I tell you, until you pay the last penny of your fine. Pretty strict people in those days, huh? And Jesus went beyond just the ordinary ways of dealing with conflicts. Do you remember what it says in Matthew 5, 43 to 48? You have heard that it was said, love your friends and hate your enemies. But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may become the children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to shine on bad and good people alike and gives rain to those who do good and to those who do evil. Why should God reward you if you love only the people who love you? Even the tax collectors do that. And if you speak only to your friends, have you done anything out of the ordinary? 
Even the pagans do that. You must be perfect just as your Father in Heaven is perfect. Wow. I wonder if uh, Matthew, the former tax collector, tax collector, was in his group when he made these comments about tax collectors. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Way back in the Old Testament, Solomon wrote that there is, quote, a time to be silent and a time to speak. Is that still true? Mm-hmm. The challenge, of course, is to find the right balance. And often it is seen the Christians have kept quiet when they probably should have been speaking up. We may claim to be the hands and feet of Jesus, but how often are we active in the public arena? What God wants from us is clearly spelled out in Psalm 146, 6 to 10, and I read, The Creator of heaven, earth, and sea, and all that is in them, He always keeps His promises. He judges in favor of the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free and gives height to the blind. He lifts those who have fallen. He loves His righteous people. He protects the strangers who live in our land. He helps widows and orphans, but takes the wicked to their ruin. The Lord is King forever. You, God, O Zion, will reign for all time. Praise the Lord. Okay? Are we doing those things? So does everything work out for good to God's people? Yeah, what about that? God's people never die. They never get in motor vehicle collisions. They never get sick. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's be honest. There are two huge forces at work in our world. And God is not the only one. It's the devil has his crew and they're going to do everything they can and the people they they want to get at the most of all are God's people. Well, I believe though that walking with God means that he can take every piece of trash that <coughs> flies my way, illness that flies, whatever it is that comes my way, he is going to weave a beautiful tapestry in my life. Mm-hmm. no matter what happens. It doesn't mean that none of us are ever going to have any problems. No, I think it means that even when we do have problems, and we will, he's there with us. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, working for justice, as outlined by a number of prophets in the Old Testament, is never a path to popularity. Trying to get society to be fair to those who are underprivileged and hurting is always a challenge. Peter, even in the New Testament, tells us, for it is better to suffer for doing good, um, yeah, if this should be God's will, than for doing evil. That's from the Good News Bible. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has an official stand on such issues. Jackie? Seventh-day Adventists believe that actions to reduce poverty and its attendant injustices are an important part of Christian social responsibility. The Bible clearly reveals God's special interest in the poor and his expectations as to how his followers should respond to those who are unable to care for themselves. All human beings bear the image of God and are the recipients of God's blessing. In working with the poor, we follow the example and teaching of Jesus. As a spiritual community, Seventh-day Adventists advocate justice for the poor and speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves and against those who deprive the poor of their rights. We participate with God who secures justice for the poor. Very good. Jesus had a number of things to say about poverty, as we know. See especially, for example, Luke 6.20. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Happy are you poor. The kingdom of God is yours. Did they collapse and faint when they heard those words? Why is that yes. so unusual in the context of which he was, in which he was speaking? That isn't uh, what success looked like in that day and age. <laughs> yeah. In their exactly. culture. Yeah, if, the idea in those days... Yes, Gordon? If, in their view, if... God th- showed you fa- it was favorable to you because you were good then you would be rich you would be healthy you would be ha- have lots of influence everything would go well so the fact that someone is poor proves that they are must be wicked yeah 
Solomon, David, and Isaiah. I also had things to say, and we won't. Well, let's look at a couple of those. Proverbs 31, 8. Speak up for people who cannot speak for themselves. Protect the rights of all who are helpless. Speak for them and be a righteous judge. Protect the rights of the poor and needy. And David in Psalm 140 said, Lord, I know that you defend the cause of the poor and the rights of the needy. The righteous will praise you indeed. They will live in your presence. And then Isaiah chapter 10 verse 2. That is how you prevent the poor from having their rights and from getting justice. That is how you take the property that belongs to widows and orphans. What will you do when God punishes you? What will you do when he brings disaster on you from a distant country? Guess what he was talking about there. So where should we go from here? Are we doing as much as we should be doing, Dennis? This is uh, from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, Ellen White. <coughs> Uh, 137.2 Search heaven and earth and there is no truth revealed more powerful than that which is made manifest in works of mercy to those who need our sympathy and aid. This is the truth as it is in Jesus. When those who profess the name of Christ shall practice the principles of the golden rule the same power will attend the gospel as in apostolic times. Wow. That's quite a promise, isn't it? When we practice the golden rule, we will have the same power that they had in apostolic times. What would that look like in 2019? Well, how do you understand that statement? Is that what is delaying the latter rain and the second coming? Margaret? Supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another. This is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow. This love is not an impulse, but a divine principle, a permanent power. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it. Only in the heart where Jesus reigns it is, is it found. This love, cherished in the soul, sweetens the life and, shreds, and sheds a refining influence on all around. This is Ellen G. White, Acts of the Apostles, page 551.2. Very good. And the, yeah. the Friday section for September 20 in the, our study guide has another quote that's quite good. Raising our voices for the voiceless, engaging in peacemaking, and similar activities may draw us into public and political arenas. However, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been a champion of the separation of church and state. What is the difference between inappropriate political involvement and speaking up and working to make peace in public ways? Wow. That's quite a question for us. To yeah, think about. exactly. So where do we draw that line? Separation of church and state, working in the public arena to make peace. <clears throat> where is that balance? We know that. Yeah. As private citizens, uh, we have the opportunity in this country. They didn't so much in Paul's day and such, but uh, since we have a uh, republic, we can we can vote, we can give feedback to our our uh, representatives, and we can uh, try to influence votes and such to provide for needs. But uh, we need to avoid trying to establish. Uh, our own particular religious. Yeah. Uh, well, I can tell you that I had the privilege one time. I worked in Africa for many years. Um, I was teaching a Sabbath school class in a church in a certain country. And right next to me was another man teaching a Sabbath school class. He was an exile from another country where there was a lot of war and strife going on. And believe it or not, when that war, that strife, dried down a little bit and a new government took over, they invited this guy who used to teach the Sabbath school class next to mine to be the prime minister of that country. Seventh-day Adventist. Prime minister. Wow. Well, there are some members in the U.S. Congress today who want to require anyone running for a national office to renounce any religious affiliation. <clears throat> How should we respond to that kind of a comment? What does that tell us about how close we are coming to the end of the history of the world? 
What should we be praying for now? Careful and faithful followers of Jesus will find their lives impacted in many ways. Doing the things that we have talked about in this lesson are never easy and rarely popular. Are we prepared to have our priorities and our motives disrupted and changed in order to help heal a hurting world? Our title suggests that this lesson is about mercy. So what's mercy? Compassion. Compassion, okay. A gift undeserved. An undeserved gift, okay. You can't fake it. Can't fake it. You can fake love, but you can't fake mercy. mercy. Yeah. The Hebrew word for mercy is hesed, which means loyal love or loving kindness. The Greek word eleos means you have a deep concern for the welfare of others. Do those words describe us? The members of our church. So what are you and your church doing to minister to your community? Are you demonstrating acts of mercy, fairness, compassion, and justice? From Ellen White in Christ's Object Lessons 417, paragraph 4, practical work will have far more effect than more sermonizing, than and mere sermonizing. We are to give food to the hungry, clothing to the naked, and shelter to the homeless. And we are called to do more than this. The wants of the soul, only the love of Christ can satisfy. Okay. Do I dare to raise a question? What would happen if one Sabbath morning, instead of coming to church, we all scattered out and did something good for the community? Would that be a worship service? Well, call me up if you're going to get busy with that kind of thing. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Is that because you, get, you want to do it on on Sabbath because you, you don't want to take another day of the week to do it? No, I'm just saying I'm comparing worship. I'm comparing this the worship being. I'm just church. I'm just yeah. raising the question because many times you see some of these things. Oh, they do something to clean it up somebody's yard. Well, the yard was been there probably seven weeks. Why would you need to do it on Sabbath? Yeah. <clears throat> About 50 years ago in Loma Linda, there was a flood. Yes. And it was late in the week. My and son was born the day of the flood. <laughs> um, wow. And on Sabbath, a lot of Seventh-day Adventists walked through, including me, mm-hmm. walked through the area of devastation. I didn't stop to help. I should have. Yeah. Okay. Some people did. Mm-hmm. But a lot didn't. Myra, I think you're next. Yes, this is a quote from um, Henry Dermond. The program of Christianity is quoted in the adult type or study guide. The tendency of religions of all time has been to care more for religion than for humanity. Christ cared more for humanity than religion, rather. His care for humanity was the chief expression of his religion. Wow. That's quite a comment, huh? The safest way for Christians is always following the example of Jesus. Jim? The Lord Jesus is our example. He came to the world as a servant of mankind. He went from city to city, from village to village, teaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing the sick. Christ spent more time in healing than in teaching. During his ministry, Jesus devoted more time in healing the sick than to preaching. However, you know, education, in fact, I think she used uh, the book Education, the education is redemption, or redemption is education. And what needs, uh, is the way we think needs educating. Yeah. And that promotes healing. So yeah. that, there's yeah. different ways of looking at that. Okay. No, there's more to education than just information. Yeah. Uh, the it's the teaching. Of healing, it, it, well, it's doing the, you know, follow me. I'm doing the, I'm healing, I'm doing good to people. That's an education as well. Okay, so now I'm going to, I'm going to put out another question to you. Jesus could touch someone and bring them back to life. He could touch someone and heal their leprosy. He could touch someone and raise them up from a bed of paralysis. We can't do those things today. I mean, we may do a long process and we may bring people closer back. I have a 
patient I've been working with for years who, when I first started working with him, he was a gunshot wound victim and had half of his head blown off just about. And uh, he was you know, just crouched over in a wheelchair. He now walks in. Oh. Amen. To the Amen. clinic. Yeah. He doesn't walk fast, but he walks. And he comes in and gives me a big hug every time. <laughs> you know that, you know that makes a difference. Well, we give us what we have, and uh, mm-hmm. God is the giver of all good gifts. So, if He wants us to heal as Jesus healed, then He will provide that that yeah. means. And at this point, and, and He hasn't. There's very good reason to believe that. In the final events in this world's history, there's going to people be people raised from the dead. The devil is going to pretend to raise people from the dead, and God is going to actually raise people from the dead. Pretty good evidence for that. Well, it doesn't seem to you like doing justice and loving mercy, as suggested by Micah six eight, would be almost impossible in our world today. Carrie. A story is told of a boy who was walking on a beach where he encountered hundreds of dying starfish that had washed ashore. The boy began tossing the starfish back into the ocean. Someone saw him and told him he could not possibly help all those starfish. As he tossed another starfish into the ocean, he answered that the little he could do made a difference to that one. (laughs) <laughs> I think that's yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> pretty pretty clear comment about that, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Well, un- so that young boy understood more than yes. than the adult asking the question. Mm-hmm. It seems like it. I mean, you could understand why an adult might look at the whole situation and say, you know, okay, uh-huh. so you throw back in a few even a hundred or so, maybe if there's thousand, I don't know, of course, how many people, how many starfish there were on the on the shore, but certainly would have made a difference to the one that got tossed back in. And what did Jesus say? Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Well, unfortunately, in our world today, those who are recipients of personal financial assistance sometimes use it for bad things. And unfortunately, I run across that pretty often in my business. There are people who think that because there's a government program that should provide for certain things that this is their right and they demand. I had a lady in my clinic today. I want one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these and, you know, she would bankrupt us if we, you know, and we had already done all those things for her in the past. She just keeps hoping that somehow or other she's homeless and hoping that somehow or other we're going to declare her disabled so that we can support her for the rest of her life. That's, that's a hard question to know how to deal with somebody like that. Well, unfortunately, we see people standing on the corners of different streets and they're begging for money and sometimes we wonder if all they want is more money for alcohol or cigarettes. How do we? How should we respond to such people? And I don't know if I'm sure we've all happened. It's all happened to all of us at one time or another. Occasionally, you'll see a woman standing with a small child. Yeah. And how do you respond to that? Yeah. Well, even street children need friendship and training for jobs if they're old enough for that. How will God judge all this? Well, we, we, by definition, say God's judgment is fair, it's just, it's merciful. Everything he does is completely transparent before the eyes of the universe. You remember that in Revelation it tells us that around God's throne there are those four living creatures, there's the 24 elder, elders, and then there's a hundred million plus angels watching everything he does. So, you know, what are the chances of doing something hidden and secret and so forth in that kind of an environment. There are a number of amazing amazing stories of Jesus healing in the New Testament. One of the ones that's uh, probably the most remarkable is found in John 8, starting with verse 2. 
Early the next morning, he went back to the temple. All the people gathered around him and sat down and began to, and he began to, he sat down and began to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery and they made her stand before them all. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. And our law, Moses commanded that such a woman must be stoned to death. Now, what do you say? They said this to trap Jesus so that they could accuse him. What, what kind of, what was the trap involved here? Well, only the Romans could, could only, execute. Only the Romans government were allowed to actually execute somebody. So if he said, go ahead and stone her, what would they have done? Accuse him, accuse him to the Roman government. You had no authority to do that. What if he said, follow the law, I mean, and just be kind to her and let her go? Then what would they have said? Oh, I'm a heretic. No, you're, you're not following the rules of, of, of Moses. So they thought they had an airtight case. Well, she can't commit adultery by herself. You noticed oh, that. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. Yeah. Which is the next thing I was yeah. going to say. Where was the man? Yeah. And the one who's supposed to, if a woman is actually caught committing adultery, the one who's bring her to, who's to bring her to the court is supposed to be her husband. Where's her husband? Mm -hmm. Well, as they stood there asking him questions, he straightened himself up and said to them, whichever one of you has committed no sin may throw the first stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on the ground. And he was writing in the dust. A few footprints, whatever, and the record would be gone. When they heard this, they all left one by one, the older ones first. Okay, so, what's the explanation for that? He was not covering a few sins here and there. I suspect that he even could have written dates down and said... Mm -hmm. And people would have said, oh, you mean he knew about that? Dates and times and names. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I suspect there are an awful lot of people there who knew stories that uh, were involved. When they heard this, they all left one by one the older ones first. I, I just, you know, Jesus, I'm sure, didn't like to embarrass people, but boy, he must have felt really good about this one. I Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there. He straightened himself up and said to her, Where are they? Is there no one left to condemn you? No. And I'm sure at that point in time she probably said, No one, sir. <laughs> well, then Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, but do not sin again. So Jesus could have written, as we've heard it said many times, he could have written just as he did on Mount Sinai in the stone could have written in the temple wall or the temple mm -hmm. floor or those that record would be there permanently to condemn those Pharisees and yeah. Sadducees but no he did it in the sand where a little bit of wind a little bit of movement of people and the record is gone not embarrassing people it's very interesting to notice that um, they're not quite sure where that story belongs in the gospel and the reason is very obvious. In the early years of Christianity, there were people who felt that even being married was, uh, uh, you know, because of the idea that, you know, anything you can touch is, is evil and anything that you, that's spiritual, anything is good is spiritual, so you can't touch it. The idea of marriage became, you know, and of course out of that we have various religious systems that forbid marriage. Um, and... They wouldn't. Have, they didn't know what to do with a story like this. I mean, Jesus telling people that this woman just go and sin no more. So it ends up in different places in, in the in the most ancient documents, in in the most ancient copies. But it's there. One group of people seeking to do something good for our families in a poor area developed a program they called Adopt a Family. As part of that program, they got people to donate Christmas gifts, which they delivered to the homes of the needy. When these strangers appeared at the door and offered gifts, the mothers were, were somewhere were somewhat reserved and the fathers sometimes disappeared out the back door when they saw the gift givers coming. At first, the givers were puzzled, but then they began to realize that they were making the parents look bad. And so the organizers developed a Christmas shop. 
Those who had no money could work at the store to earn what would be needed to purchase gifts for the family, and the price of the gifts was very reasonable. Thus, on Christmas Day, parents could experience the joy of watching their children open gifts that the parents had provided with their own hands. They changed the name of their program from Adopt a Family to Pride for Parents. Well, we already talked about peacemaking. The challenges in this lesson seem almost... Well, we, we can look at a couple of verses here. Um, look at Hebrews twelve fourteen. Try to be at peace with everyone and try to live a holy life because no one will see the Lord without it. Try to be at peace with everyone. Is that possible in our world? So much as it depends on your, your, you. Yeah, yeah, but it uh, takes two to have peace. So Yeah. Jesus intended for us to be at peace no matter what is going on around us. And Paul also reflected that idea. The challenges in this lesson seem, most in, seem almost insurmountable. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can reach out in ways that are meaningful and helpful to those who need it most. And I would like to ask this question. If we really did our job in reaching out to the poor and needy, would we be flocking, would homeless people be flocking into our church? Would we object to that? Or is that a good thing? I suspect it would not just be homeless people, but everyone would be flocking there. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be nice. How do we how do we get a balance between addressing the spiritual needs and the physical needs of people? Because we could go over what I mean. The Salvation Army. Ellen White talks about the Salvation Army. Says they're doing a wonderful job. We need to bless them, but it's not our job to to do what they're doing, not to compete with them. So that's a different situation. So the example with Jesus would be help people physically, but find somehow or other in that process, find a way to bring the gospel to them as well. Can we do that? Is that something that we're... Or is that just not even possible in our day? What do you think? We could do it? Well, we're running out of time. If somebody wants a really short answer. I would like to challenge you out there to think of ways in your community where you could reach out to the community, help them in, in their needs, and preach, preach the gospel to them at the same time. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to come together and talk about your word, to re recognize these incredible challenges that we have talked about today. Help us to know how we can reach out in, in ways that are meaningful and ways that are not only practically helpful but spiritually helpful as well as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.